Hello everyone, a very good morning to those who are joining us from Singapore and Asia and good afternoon or good evening to all of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you for being here with us for today's online event at the Age of Autonomy, How Robot Dash Reshaping the Future of Logistics, presented by SG Innovate and partnered with the High Commission of Canada. My name is Jin from SG Innovate, and as a Singapore government-backed investor, we have been building up and driving deep tech innovations in AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technologies across various industries. At SG Innovate, much of our work is to connect Singapore with the global deep tech ecosystem to learn how we can better harness technology for next generation intelligence and decision making. Today, we have our panel of experts from Singapore and Canada to talk about the advancements in autonomous robots for applicability to supply chain and the opportunities that are available. We encourage you to engage with our speakers during the session by submitting your questions in the Q&A box located on the lower panel of your screen. Without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator for this discussion, Victor, to start us off. Victor, please. Thanks, Jin. And uh, good morning to everyone who's joining us today, to our panelists you know, and, and to our guests uh, from Singapore and around the world. Uh, 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 welcome to the session on the age of autonomy you know, and, and how robots are reshaping the future of logistics. Right. Uh, uh, so this is this is a super exciting uh, topic um, that we have for today, and we and we have three folks, you know, that that we have, that we have invited, especially to share a bit more around the, about the insights and kind of like what they've been doing in the space. Um, so we have uh, we have Niraj Gupta, who's the Chief Strategy Officer and Advisor to the CEO at Adabotics. Uh, we have David McFarlane, who is the Vice President, uh, and, and he covers global alliances at Kinova. We have Rahul Nambia a co-founder and CEO at BotSync. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm the direct, Director of Venture Investing here at SG Innovate. Um, and, and I'll take you through the day with uh, you know, all the fun questions and then all, all the fun insights we're going to get from the speakers. So, so to begin, uh, let's, let's start by inviting our, our three panelists to share a little bit more about themselves, you know, um, uh, what, what they do at, at their company, what, is it, what does the company want to, want to achieve in the world, you know, and also kind of like their, their short journey, right, as to how they got to where they are today uh, doing, uh, doing what they do with robotics. So um, I'll, I'll invite Neeraj to start first. Uh, uh, quick one to two minutes you know, around all those questions that I just asked. Neeraj, please. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Victor. Um, hi, everyone. I am Neeraj. I am a Chief Strategy Officer at Atabotics. So Atabotics is basically um, a system with, that provides 3D robotics warehousing and fulfillment. So basically, it's inspired by ant colonies. So Atabotics condenses a traditional warehouse into a single vertical storage structure. And inside the structure, robotic shuttles move in the three-dimensional space uh, and deliver good to the workers. So we essentially uh, automate the entire warehouse solution, uh, uh, what is called as good to person robotics. And uh, I've been part of Adabotics for, uh, for more than a year now. And uh, we have seen the journey from being a startup three years back to raising very recently Series C and seeing a tremendous uh, need of automation in the supply chain and especially in warehousing. And that's where I feel it's a very exciting times in terms of what could be done with robotics and deep technologies like AI and machine learning. So thank you. Uh, Victor, you are- uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, um, thanks Niraj for the sharing. Uh, could we get David to share, to share his journey also? Welcome David. Thank you, Victor. Uh, yeah, Dave, David McFarlane, uh, first of all, not an engineer, not a mechatronic specialist. Uh, I've learned, uh, I've learned, I've learned that very, very interesting ways in my, in my new job previously. And prior to this, I worked in business strategy, corporate strategy, um, economic development as well. Uh, and, uh, in, well, originally I worked with a group called the Investor Small Quebec out of, uh, Quebec, that's both a private equity fund, commercial bank, and uh, responsible for economic development in, in Quebec and foreign direct investment attraction. I was then uh, poached out of there to uh, work with uh, the new Canadian government in, in a political role um, where I was uh, the director of policy to the Minister of Innovation uh, and then his uh, chief of staff from an, an incredible journey in itself, but one that I was very glad to return to the private sector uh, this uh, spring. Um, and I began with Canova. And Canova's 
quickly for those who don't know it, uh, began its journey as a company uh, that made assistive uh, robotics, robotic arms for people with severe upper body disabilities, um, uh, allowing people uh, to complete tasks as mundane as open the fridge and pour a glass of milk uh, through to much more complex tasks like function and interface with computers. Um, here we are. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. And Rahul, could get you to introduce yourself too? Sure. Thanks, Victor. Uh, morning, everyone. All right. So my name is Rahul. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Botsync. Uh, I, I used to be an engineer. I'm still, still I'm an engineer, but I do less engineering <laughs> nowadays than I used to. Uh, right. So as a, as a company, what we do is we build autonomous mobile robots to move payloads from anywhere between 30, 30 kilograms, 1,000 kilograms. And our main focus of, of developing technology is about how do we make this work in dynamic environments? Uh, environments with forklifts, people, humans working together. And how do we deploy these robots in such environments very quickly so that the companies can start using automation immediately from, from day one or day two? Uh, so that's what, that's what our main proposition is and what's we, that's what we're building on as well. Uh, in terms of my journey, I suppose, uh, we, as founders, four founders in the company, we started working together about six and a half years ago. Uh, in, in university. So we started working on different robotic projects. Uh, so it was four years of working together, uh, trying to figure out how we could fit in as, as a team before we started the company. So I guess uh, that's how the inspiration came in. We started with educational robotics for almost a year and a half. Uh, it's still a core part of what we do. But last day we started looking into the industrial space is when we raised our seed round as well. So yeah, that's, that's a brief history of how I came into this. Thank you, Rahul. And thanks everyone for the introductions. So let's, let's get into the topic proper. Uh, and I want to take the use the first question to kind of set the scene, right? Um, so starting from a from a broad perspective, you know, how how big a role uh, do you think uh, robotics play uh, plays in the in the in the space uh, uh, of logistics today, right? So how how big you know of a role does robotics play in the logistics industry today, and what do you believe is the future of robotics for the logistics industry? So. Um, Anyone can start first, uh, the, you know, and, and this question is, is, is directed at all three of you. No volunteers? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll take a cut. I, I mean, Victor, I'd, I'd like to say that, that thankfully, you know, the one thing history has taught us that there is no one future. Yeah. Um, there'll be many different solutions. Uh, you know, I, I, I look at like, the incredible systems that Adabiotics has developed, uh, you know, uh, just wild, beautiful. Um, but will will that be suited to every SME? Um, will that be suited to every business? Well, I think there's probably space for, for different types of solutions. Um, you know, not, not everyone is willing to either invest so much or move it all the way over um to to such a to a new and innovative system uh near age i almost like to hear what you have to say <laughs> yeah, absolutely like um i can give you some data points i'm an engineer and also did my master's in mathematics so i'll give i'll throw a lot of numbers <laughs> nice so, okay we love numbers yeah <laughs> so if you'll see um 2017, there was uh, a data uh, that was uh, done in terms of warehouse automation, and only 16% of the warehouses globally were automated. Oh. 2000, uh, and out of which the bigger chunk was Amazon and Walmart. Amazon started doing a lot of automation and using robotics in 2014, and then Walmart, you know, kind of started and followed the trend. Right, uh, 2017, the number from those 16% uh, had uh, gone up by by 25%, so it was around 26% by that. Mm -hmm. Next year was 32%. The very next year was around 36%. In last six months, it has gone beyond 56%. Just in wow. last six months. See, so the problem is um, everybody's trying to figure out the future, right? Um, uh, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic shows traditional supply chains can't support modern consumer behavior. And it accelerated the transition, you know, the automation transition. You know, before pandemic, bigger constraint was 
tight labor market, right? You need to hire people. And now because of pandemic, you need to have social distancing and that's where the entire automation could help supply chain. And the important part is transparency. So robotics and automation can provide a greater transparency, connecting supply, supply data with needs in a timely way. And that would enable the network to be more useful for both retailers and consumers. And that's the reason why suddenly everybody is not only thinking about COVID, but post COVID also, they do understand that they, they started, it becomes difficult to just accept any transition, be it, uh, you know, digital or robotics, like IOT and the hardware side of it. And that's where this, this entire uh, pandemic has been leap of faith for all these uh, supply chain owners mm. Uh, who have started thinking about how they can utilize different process, be it like if you talk about warehousing, so be it scanning and packaging mm. or good supers, and which is what uh, robotics does, or robots picking arm, the pickers, you know, um, yep. or automated loading. So there are small, small solutions and based on the needs and based on what uh, these uh, supply chain in the food chain people are, they're utilizing those, um, uh, you know, processes and mm -hmm. trying to figure out how they could in next two years completely transition themselves from totally manual to come something which is more 70, 80% automated. And they know that they cannot remove the need of human uh, intervention, but at least if they could have that social distancing as well as more efficiency, they would love to have that. And that's what is very exciting right now hmm. for companies like us interesting point and I, I mean like so so the pandemic that has actually been a catalyst you know for 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 businesses such as yours uh, in, in in getting uh, existing supply chains to 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 transform uh the, the way they're doing business right and and and, and it seems like do you think do you think that's the case absolutely so we look at um antibiotics the biggest uh, uh when we started the big uh, we had this patented technology which kind of reduces retailers warehouse footprint by 85%, mm -hmm. 85%. Mm -hmm. wow. So, you know, the problem was most of the warehouses were outside the city because uh, within the city, if you have large warehouses, it's costly, right? Yep. By reducing yep. it by 85%, you can yep. just literally start going inside the city, start setting up those micro fulfillment centers, which mm -hmm. have the same efficiency, right? And so then they said, wow, that's awesome. What that also did was, reduce the the logistics last supply last mile connectivity the same day delivery requirements yep. that's where yep. groceries and uh, you know these retailers started thinking about how they could automate so automation is not only about removing the human intervention it is mm. more about same day delivery there are so many factors that yep. come into the picture and that's where we feel that not only company like us but the entire ecosystem what mm. i say is when e-commerce was invented and uh, or started, and countries like in India, when uh, Flipkart kind of company started, it was not not just the e-commerce boom. Analytics, yep. last mile delivery, so many Everything, other. Yep. Things. Similarly, right now in robotics and supply chain, especially, it's not just one company that is making a dent. Mm. Collectively, there are so many elements th which are working mm -hmm. towards this automation, which are changing the entire industry. Interesting. And, 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 and Rahul, from your perspective, have you, have you been, been, been noticing the same thing with your customers, with the people you've been talking to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, from, from before COVID to what it is now, I think a lot of things have changed. Uh, I think okay. one very interesting observation from our side in terms of customers we are talking to in India and in Singapore and around the region as well, is that before the COVID pandemic, things used to be a bit heterogeneous in terms of what items need to be moved. Because we deal with uh, pallets and, and big loads, uh, okay. not goods to person like what Adabotics does, but more like automated storage, uh, taking items from staging, putting it away into the rack lines, for instance, and bringing it back on request. So what we noticed before is that it used to be quite heterogeneous in the sense that it was never standardized. The processes mm -hmm. in terms of what items are moved, what type of pallets were moved, were never really standardized for automation to come in and actually make that impact. But what we've seen over the, over the last few months is that people have started identifying what needs to be changed in small, small metrics so they can bring in robotics into that field. And that's really helped us as well. For instance, we used to have issues with dealing with uh, N number of pallet types in one warehouse itself, or one particular process itself, it made it a nightmare for us to deploy our products. And what has changed over the period is people have understood 
what operationally the changes they need to make are for robotics to come make an impact. And I think that has really changed over the last few months. Uh, people start identifying that, okay, I can't just expect a company to come in and completely change what I'm doing, but mm-hmm. there needs to be an impact from my, a change from my side as well. Uh, so most of the customers they talk to, I think that that progress has really happened. And I think they're already starting gearing up, like, like what they have mentioned as well, to think about operationally how they can implement robotics to mm. add value to the processes. And that's, that's what the trend we have seen as well for most of the customers we work with. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I continue to the next question, I want to let the audience know uh, uh, you, there's going to be a Q&A at the end of, of the session. Um, and, and during the meantime, if you have questions you, you would like to ask, uh, please fill it in on the Q&A section of, of, of the tabs below. Right. Uh, don't put it into the main chat box because uh, it gets a little confusing after a while. So put it in the Q&A section and we'll address those questions as we, as we, as we uh, hit the end of the session. Uh, so, but, so thanks, thanks for sharing that. So, so we all, so the, the, the sense is, ge- is generally, yes, you know, like, like, like uh, robotics has become a, 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 a much key, uh, more important uh, factor in, in how companies are, are looking at supply chains. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the take up has been pretty quick because of COVID, you know, and people are starting to realize that this is really crucial, right? Um, so based on what you've seen, uh, what is the, the current level of autonomy that the robots have within the logistics space? Like how much of it is, autom- is, is, is fully automated to a point where the, where the systems react on their own uh, versus how much of it is, is still, you know, there's still a, a, an operator that has to, to manually manage that, that, that part of the, of the process? Um, there are different kind of uh, solutions and every company has different kind of, uh, you know, solutions where there are semi autonomous to fully auto- autonomous. The problem which I see or the challenge, if you, if you may, are like there is, if in a supply chain and the food chain, there will be seven automated or robotics processes, different processes. And in order to stitch that, there is a human intervention required. Mm. So if we are goods to person, but we can, deliver the goods to uh, to the place where you know the manual picker can pick up those items and can then package it then he needs to put it at conveyor belt or some some other robots to send it to the trucks right so uh, in all those processes you need to have human intervention nothing is totally automated as far as the supply chain is concerned mm-hmm. but if you look at uh, um, you know solutions like ours we are almost 95% autonomous, right? Mm-hmm. Apart from the fact that whenever there is any kind of a robotic failure and all, you need to have human intervention. But beyond that, it's totally autonomous within that structure, what we are talking about. Now, our biggest hurdle, or we are trying to figure out how we can use more robotic processes to also automate and stitch the other elements to it mm. and which is going to be not only challenging but also cost if uh, you know time consuming and not cost effective uh, but we need to do that and probably it will take time to to completely mm. autonomize this entire process but it will ha- eventually happen and that's where there's a bigger kicker because all the companies like us and different other companies are so busy fulfilling the requirements right now you know it's a time when we we are trying to and we we are getting a lot of data and this is helping us because now we are able to understand the exact needs and the pain point of different kind of retailers and different kind of uh, large corporates. And that's mm-hmm. where we are. We are start thinking about what could be could be done next. And that's where collaboration is happening. A lot of different companies and market is so big that the collaboration has started happening mm-hmm. between the companies. We are, we already have collaborated with with three large corporates in in last three months. Mm-hmm. David Rahul, any, anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I think uh, what Neeraj mentioned as well, like one, one issue we see is that different elements of aut- robotic automation in a warehouse don't really talk to each other. That's one important thing for us as a company as we've been working quite closely with a lot of partners, both corporates and other startups, they essentially build that communication channel so that hmm. transition of items between different robotic processes is a bit more seamless. I think one thing which is still, at least for us or me personally, is that uh, at the moment, we have restrictions on what type of uh, items we can handle, size or, or the shape, for instance. I think at least a lot of the facilities we have automated, that's still one, one bottleneck that certain robotic automation systems are designed for one particular size of items or particular shape of items. And, and there's still a lack of, I guess, flexibility in terms of what it can handle. 
So beyond mm-hmm. a certain size, we still need that human element to come in and uh, handle that exception because the robotic system can't handle that, that particular type of shape, particular type of size. Uh, so I guess that, that's one aspect of how uh, we're looking at it as well. And how do we address this in the long term so that it becomes truly autonomous in terms of material handling? So maybe I'll, I'll go into some questions uh, on, on the, the individual businesses that you guys are, are working with. You know, um, for, for Neeraj, so, so you, you did mention that COVID has definitely uh, um, accelerated the pace, you know, of the pickup, right, for, for, for the use of robotics within, within, within the supply chain. Uh, do you think that this is, this is sustainable in the long term? Meaning that, you know, once companies are on it, right, uh, but do you think it makes sense for them to keep staying on it? You know, or, or is this just temporary because, you know, for the, for the time being, because of the pandemic, you know, uh, you know human touch is not really the, the, the most desired thing. Or, or, do you, or do you believe that the, the, the future is, is you know, uh, uh, automated by, by robotics? Um, when you talk about solution like us, the biggest hurdle to onboard any client is they need to start changing their entire supply chain process. Mm. Digitally as well, because when you're automating things, it's not that manual person will just fetch in the data. They need mm. to change a lot of things, a lot yeah. of processes within. So it takes a lot of time for a company to start thinking about changing their processes that will fit in the automation needs within the organization. Yeah. And second is right now the solution, even like us, are capital intensive initially. You know, it's not that simple to just say, oh, okay, let's let's automate our fulfillment solution. It it's it takes millions of dollars. So that's where we feel that somebody at the companies which have started looking at this, once they will transform themselves, um, you know, they will start using it for the foreseeable future and and uh, completely transform themselves because even in order for them to do a break even, it will take time. The investment is a long term process in the automation, uh, you know, kind of a solution, a robotic solution. Second thing is, is this is where, uh, you know, companies like, uh, X, um, uh, you know, Adabotics started thinking about micro fulfillment, which is more like a mall concept. So mm-hmm. you don't invest on, on uh, automating your entire warehouse. We mm-hmm. own the structure. We own the, uh, the real estate. We own even the last one delivery. You just right. are a tenant. And the multi-tenant environment and micro fulfillment, almost like which can fit uh, behind the gas station. Mm-hmm. And, nice. you know, why that is another interesting aspect, because many of the small retailers, uh, which are not able to automate their solution, have started thinking about how can we make use of Microsoft Women solutions. Mm-hmm. So I think the entire industry's mindset is changing drastically. Okay. And and it's, 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 it's kind of last six months have been so uh, drastic in terms of change, change that now it's going to sustain. It's not going to change mm. that easily. I think it's for, for the good, actually. Interesting. I'm going to switch gears now, you know, to kind of move, move a little away from, from, from robotics within logistics specifically, you know, to kind of uh, uh, go into what Kinova is looking to do. Right. So as, as we look at, you know, a, a global population where, where, you know, where people age, age 60 or over are looking to double by 2050, uh, 2050, right. The, 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 the the aging population issue uh, is not going to change, right? Um, uh, as the world changes, you know, there's there are certain implication in, t- in terms of like healthcare or housing issues. You know, so, so to, to David, you know, um, what do you think would be the potential of AI and robotics, especially what Kinova is doing in solving many of these big challenges that are fast approaching us? Uh, you're, right, you're right, the challenges are, the challenges are enormous. I, I mean, but you know, uh, we, we, we've already demonstrated over the last decade that, that humans and robots can, can, can live together. Um, people with, with severe physical disabilities uh, use our robots, interact with them, live with them daily, and, and, and it makes their lives better. Uh, the, the challenge will be with, with an aging population, um, again, to identify the, the needs um, and and this this we can bring back to the business aspect because I believe it's a very similar problem. I, you know what what are the needs what are the needs of seniors autonomy leading to eventually increased independence um, some of some of the simple tasks that robots can handle quite well uh, the repetitive uh, heavy lifting um, you know it's certainly 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 robots can help but they. they 
they're not really that good at fighting loneliness. So, you know, there are, there are limits to what they can do uh, and, and where humans and where humans have to fit in. Um, so Canova is trying to build on that, that background of, of augmenting human behavior and, and human capabilities. Um, and this, well, right now, currently we're, we're prototyping our, our first, uh, our first cobot for release to market uh, this winter. Um, and, and we're looking at logistic applications. And, and, and the point is exactly what Nerd said, where, what, what are the trouble spots? Where does it break down in the current supply chain? Um, how can an, how can a robotic arm, uh, fit into the process? Um, and, you know, as we move through this, we've done it with hazardous materials. We've done it with bomb disposal for different companies. Um, it, it, it's a challenge every time though. And, uh, understanding the actual business opportunity is more based on needs than, than technology, uh, than, than technological capability. Um, there are the limits and, 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 and we keep blowing through them as, as do all these companies all the time. Um, that, that's just my thought. <laughs> Thanks, David. And, and, and. As you look at the assistive technologies, you know, for 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 you know for for the aged uh, and the disabled, you know, um, is it, is it possible to achieve uh, some kind of symbiotic relationship between uh, you know human and robot workers? Uh, you know, I, I'd say 100%. Uh, again, uh, there there are you know the limits are of course uh, speed um, and 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 technology challenges, path tracing, um, like autonomous path tracing, but we're doing it right now. Mm. Um, it, these robotic arms um, are lightweight, fit onto wheelchairs, and 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 to help people with with their daily tasks. Um, mm. And and they've learned to live with them. And uh, it, it's got to start with a need, though. Yep. Um, yep. And uh, you know, I, I I think some of the characteristics of 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 the Canova arm and, and others that are out there. I mean, we're not the, we're not the only ones doing it. UR does it really well. Uh, how, how do humans work is probably the harder, harder part of the puzzle. <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to let the robots out of the cages, um, you have to understand uh, what, what appears to be a highly unstructured environment. Mm -hmm. There will be, I think as Neeraj was, intimating, you know, their business processes have to change. Protocols have to change. I mean, look, look, look at autonomous vehicles. We, you know, we're living in a world where uh, the protocols are designed for humans, by humans. Mm. Um, I, I, it seems to me that the uptake of the autonomous vehicle is going to require protocols that are designed by humans and machines for humans and machines to interact. Uh, much the same will occur in, in, in supply chains. And, and I'm sure Rahul deals with the same challenges all the time. Yeah. And thanks, thanks for that, David. Uh, I, so I'm going to move on to, 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 to ask Rahul uh, from a different perspective. You guys are, are, are fairly large companies. You know, Rahul, Rahul's coming from, from you know, the, the, he's, the, he's the challenger, right? And he's the guy who's, who's, who's working, you know, in the weeds currently and, you know, and, and, and if you guys didn't know, he just raised a successful seed round in June this year. Congratulations, uh, Rahul. Uh, and, and, and all that happened in this crisis, right? During a pandemic, you know, you managed to raise funds uh, for a robotics company. Uh, was, there, was there some reason why that, 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 that happened? Like, you know, uh, uh, you, you would think that, oh, no, you know, like everyone has no money to spend. You know, everyone's going to limit their, their, you know. So why, why do you think people have invested in, in, in your company? Right. Uh... Yeah, I think I think it helped to have some good early investors in the company. I think having them watch for us was a was a big turning point. Of course, we had a, a round before this uh, in early December two thousand eighteen. So I, I guess one good thing for us that worked is investors from them from them they vouch for us going into the next round. So that really mm -hmm. helped change things. Uh, and I guess it's also about the traction. So I guess it just fit that a lot of the customers going into the pandemic suddenly decided that this is a good time to start trialing our products. Uh, a good opportunity for us to get the initial traction we need uh, to first consolidate a lot of technology designs, the product, and to prove to uh, the investors you're talking to that the products made sense and added value to the processes mm. or to the operations of the companies you're working with. 
I guess it presented a good story. Uh, so we had the team, we had good backers, and we had the initial traction we needed to show that there's potential to grow this even further. So I guess, we were, I mean, considering what the situation was, I think we were fortunate to have that, uh, that traction at that stage to get that conversions only early on. So once we got the first lead investor on, on board, I guess things from there was a bit easier. So it was a painful process to get the first investor on board. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely agree. Uh, considering, like you said, that people don't want to get take cash out of their pockets. I think the first getting the first check was a hard part. Mm. But I think subsequently, once that initial, I guess that uh, faith was placed in us, I think was a lot easier from there. So that mm. made my life a lot, a lot, a lot easier. So, so, yeah. so, be, so beyond your core business of 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 you know of um, of reducing uh, helping companies reduce the dependencies right on forklifts and personnel to move uh, materials around. Um, how, how can these companies also take advantage of, of the different data types that you're collecting right, at this point in time? And is, 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 there, is, is there some thought around kind of like, you know, uh, it's a strategy around the data that you're collecting and how it can help, uh, you know, the future of logistics? Right, absolutely. So uh, I think one very important data which we're starting to see is that from the way the robots are used, it also kind of shows the resource allocation within the warehouse in terms of where people are put, what process are choking up, and what processes are not, I guess, evenly uh, attributed to in terms of risk allocation. So mm -hmm. what that shows is supervising the warehouses. Are, are, am I sending people the right way? Am I putting them in the right areas, in the right processes? So more than just the robots improving throughput from moving items, I guess the throughput efficiency improvements also come from understanding that it also shows where the resources are allocated inside the warehouse. Because we often see that we, especially in staging lanes, for instance, when trucks come in, it's generally a pile of, of balance because the manpower resources are allocated in the wrong places. I think what we've seen over the last few months is that the data that we have actually helps warehouse supervisors decide better where to keep the human resources within the warehouse. So these pile ups, these choking points within the warehouse could be better addressed. So the overall efficiency gets a lot, gets a lot more improvement than what is possible just reporting out of automation processes. Thank you. And, and, and you know, what, what, is, what is the vision for, for, for Botsing Labs? Uh, is it a training facility for existing and new workforce? You know, like uh, how does that play play into your your, your long term vision? Right. So uh, uh, the reason we started the company was a passion for robotics. Uh, I think we kind of put that on hold to get the commercial uh, and I guess aspects moving forward. So once we raised around and we started moving forward with the business of automation, we started to tap back into what we uh, the Labs initiative. Es essentially because we started seeing that after deployment of our products, a lot of the challenges in getting the full efficiency out of it was the fact that the people in the warehouse didn't know how to use it fully. Uh, so that was, I guess, the, the I guess inspiration behind starting this initiative again. Uh, so mm -hmm. we started from a very simple aspect of how do we teach robotics to as many people as we can, support research as well as training. So right mm -hmm. now the focus of B-Labs is essentially to support universities and polytechnics that train the workforce on robotic aspects. So you partner with these institutes to give them the platform, support them in structuring the content, show them what the industrial departments look like. So mm -hmm. people coming into the courses have a more realistic idea of how to use the products. Mm -hmm. And long term, what we're looking to do it is, is expand that so that we can do it ourselves. So yeah. that the workforce themselves know how different aspects of robotics and not just AMRs is what we do today. Mm -hmm. They have a good idea of how the different elements of robotics work together. So that mm. even post deployments, our life becomes easier, as well as for the general robotics community, that people in the workforce know how to make the best use of, of robotic automation. So that's, mm. that's the inspiration behind B-Labs and what we're trying to address. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, for, for today's session, we actually have a, a, a pretty large number of corporates and industry associations who are interested to find, to find out you know, a bit more around how you know, they can engage with robotics companies uh, such as yourselves. Right? So, so maybe like, if you could share kind of like, how, how do you typically um, um, engage or work you know, with some of the corporates that you're already working with, right? And, and, and typically, you know, how, how should someone who's never uh, explored, you know, introducing robotics into, into their workflow, think about this engagement, right? So, so, so I would love to hear from the different perspectives, uh, because all three of you represent very different types of businesses in a sense. You know, uh, how, how should people get started in terms of engaging with you? Uh, I'll start with uh, Niraj, maybe. Oh, Niraj, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, 
um, we typically get a lot of inbound calls uh, from retailers and especially people which have large warehouses and they want to automate it. And when they start thinking about it, we start from the data point of view. We, we kind of ask the certain amount of data, different kind of data in terms of SKUs, in terms of their performing needs, in terms of what kind of a requirements they have. And from there we start and typically the supply chain head of the company or the, uh, uh, the, the fulfillment centers head, they start interacting with us, start giving us the data points based on which we are able to understand their requirement. And that is where based on those requirements, we are able to tell them the size of the entire solution, what kind of uh, expenses and uh, you know, the cost they can uh, think of uh, budgeting for that particular process and how uh, that entire process and supply chain will change because you also need to change certain digital aspect of your uh, processes. And a lot of companies already have it. For example, our entire stack is on Microsoft Azure Cloud and we use a lot of Microsoft technologies. So stitching becomes one of the important aspects to it. And our teams typically come into that picture and start working. Once that entire hurdle is uh, it's gone, it takes six months to nine months typically to install any solution. And that's where our local teams start getting activated. We are very heavy on the North American market, but we have started seeing tremendous opportunities in Japan and in Singapore and uh, Thailand. And uh, now we have started also thinking about how our supply chain should be built in order to you know, fulfill the, the, the requirements in Asia. So that's where typically we start um, uh, doing, uh, we have our own manufacturing unit in Calgary. So most of the robots and everything we manufacture within Calgary, but we okay. also have uh, a kind of a support center in LA where robots are mm. supported and uh, we, we do all those fixings and everything else. So uh, it's a process, yeah. but the process, first of all, for first three months is more about data and understanding and the price points and everything. And then next six months are more about, uh, you know, putting the skeleton in place and, and all those mm. before the entire operations can be started. Cool. Thank you, Neeraj. And, and David for, uh, for, 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 for Kinova? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we, we successfully grew into a medical equipment uh, company at, via, via partnership, actually. Um, uh, you know, the, the big question is uh, engineering services, or, 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 or co-development, it was, it was sort of a hybrid uh, process with a large and growing American company uh, that's since, since been acquired by Johnson & Johnson, so, so a larger company, um, uh, to develop an endoscopic surgical platform. Uh, we are the OEM uh, for the arms. We designed and, 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 and did a great deal of the engineering and they did much of the integration work, provide the medical expertise. Um, it's now uh, in the field in hospitals throughout the U.S. and, and we hope around the world uh, in, in, in the next few years. Uh, so, you know, partnership was fundamental to that kind of growth. We, we can't be experts in everything. We're, we're pretty good at making robotic arms. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, uh, but, but, you know, as, as it evolves and we're looking at different sectors like logistics, um, like, like, like industrial work. Um, there have been some really interesting government programs put on and put on in Canada, this sort of super clusters initiative that allows us an opportunity to partner with companies across the country, uh, both the manufacturing end on an artificial intelligence end. Um, and I mean, it's, it, you know, it allows us introductions in, into large corporates working on things as well as meeting new and young innovative companies. Uh, for example, that have in then interesting end effectors, et cetera, that can be applied in different fields and also concrete to build concrete use cases. Um, so that it, we're, we're looking, we're looking intently at, at those programs and, and, and how to grow our business that way as well. Thanks, David. And Rahul, uh, what is what has your experience been in terms of you know engaging with with, uh, uh, with corporates, you know, and and you know just just with with customers, uh, and and how how has that process been? How long does it take? Right. So uh, generally, the trend has been that we do a very short pilot period, a one a one month pilot. So generally, assistants go live. I mean, the, the setup happens in three days, uh, mm -hmm. within wow. a week. So basically, what we start with is we take a very simple flow. 
uh, in terms of what process they want to automate. It could be very, very simple. I think generally the past six months, we just take a very simple process, uh, set up the system in two to three days, uh, and then let the system run for most a month. So that gives a very good uh, metric for the company using it, understand it, meets the requirements. Uh, and for us as well to see how, if their process fits what we have at that point mm -hmm. in time. So I guess it's a good one month period for us, for the company and for us to get a good relationship going. If, if, if it aligns with what they need, what we have aligns with what process they're looking to automate. And the, the metrics at the end of one month match what they're expecting out of it. Then we engage in a, on, a, on, a, on a, either a, a longer contract or an outright purchase. So generally that's been the transfer fund. Thank you. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take a couple of questions uh, from the Q and A. Uh, there, there's some uh, very enthusiastic questions here, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna share them with you guys. Um, the first one is from Aisha. Uh, with such high demand for automation, um, do we have enough capacity from from you know from companies like like Adabotics to, to support that globally, right? And 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 uh, and within that within that you know uh, what technology do you see being a bottleneck uh, to to the desired end state? So anyone can take this. Yeah. So as, as I said, uh, from uh, Adabotics point of view, uh, we are getting so many uh, orders within North America that it is becoming difficult. And now suddenly, you know, Asia is becoming extremely, uh, extremely interesting for us, uh, even GCC countries for that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, our biggest challenge uh, is uh, different kind of compliances, just like what David said, that it's not just simple selling your robots or structure, the compliance, that country's law, and especially when you're manufacturing, and if you can have a partnership-led manufacturing, and um, that is, so, so far we have been more autonomous within, in terms of manufacturing support, everything. Now we have started exploring different kind of opportunity for globally, uh, for the global markets. But just to tell you the truth, it's not gonna be that simple. It will take us six months to eight months just to understand this entire Asian market or where mm -hmm. should we start? Uh, and then the manufacturing units, whether we should retain it here. And because of COVID, it's not that simple to just simply uh, do a simple supply chain uh, and logistics. So, so we, we are trying to figure out and that's where I see it's a huge market. We, in the fulfillment space, I think you will see at least 500% growth in terms of companies you will uh, probably next three, three years, you will see at least 500 more companies coming into the same uh, uh, kind of uh, service, services and um, uh, you know, technologies. Uh, the point is, and it will be more local. And mm -hmm. we, while we want to become a very global company, we are also trying to figure out how to do this balance between North American requirement and the Asian and European requirement. So I don't think that uh, companies like us overnight can transform ourselves. It'll take mm. time, but we mm. definitely get the global footprint. And uh, as David rightly mentioned, partnership is the model, and we are trying yeah. to figure out that model. And maybe just uh, if I can dive in, uh, just a little bit into the regulation part of, of, of things, right? You mentioned that, that that is potentially an issue. Uh, could you be more specific in terms of like you know uh, uh, what are specifically the, the the you know the jurisdictions that 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 um, that pose an issue and, and also, you know, what is the kind of timeline or time frame that people are looking for when it comes to getting, you know, regulatory uh, compliance or, or just, just getting, getting to understand what, what are these regulations? Different kind of things like health and safety for that matter. Every country has different kind of thing or GDPR policies in Europe, like uh, Canada is very, very strong in terms of cybersecurity and the data policy, but GDPR compliance itself, you may have to change certain aspect of data, uh, you know, security aspect of it. Mm. Or uh, if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, fire safety me measures. So every country you need to go and it's not like you have a global compliance. You need, yes. to, uh, you need to kind of look into it. And of course, if you have something in US, it becomes easier, but the process will take its own time and challenge. So every country going over there, you need to have those certifications. You need to have those health and safety measures. You need to have all those aspects and think about it. If you're talking about five countries, it may take us next one year just to get that thing to wow. because it takes time. And with, because of COVID, it's not going to be simple because all these things are also manual in nature yeah. at times. Yeah. So that's, that's a bigger, a biggest hurdle for us. Right? Thank you, Niraj. 
uh, uh, next part of the question is around which country um, or, or, or which companies you know have has the most innovation in robotics that uh, that 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 you that you've seen. Uh, is this a question for David or Rahul? Oh, for anyone, you can, anyone can answer this. You know, I so, think so David, like... can, David definitely can be <laughs> one. He's been part of government and everything. I, I I am in Canada, so I would always say Canadian, but <laughs> but David can <laughs> insight about well, it. I, <laughs> I, I I mean, you know, in in assistive tech, Canada Canada's been, Canada's been a leader, um, and uh, but you know, let's look at adoption to a certain degree too. Uh, Canova exports 90% plus of, of, of our production. Um, wow. as we, we have a subsidiary in Germany uh, to sell the assistive tech. Um, so much depends on, it, 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 it's, it's not exactly regulatory, but uh, government assistance for the purchasers of assistive technologies, um, which with health insurance programs are adopted. Uh, it, the, 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 the complexity is massive. The bottlenecks, if, if I go back to that question, for sure global capacity is going to have to scale massively if we're going to, you know, move to automate uh, warehouses around the world. But but I think that the, the bottlenecks are more classically, again, human, uh, regulatory, cultural, um, uh, labor issues. Um, you know, uh, how, how do we put humans back in the center? Um, you know, so, yeah. Man, it, seem, it seems like humans are the ones that, that they keep, that they just keep, you know, putting, <laughs> putting walls in front of technology. <laughs> well, look, at, if you look at the technology part, uh, and David uh, made a very strong point, and I think Raul should definitely pitch it into this, is, for example, in Canada, there's a federal grant called Scale AI. So anything in supply yeah. chain, and AI, you get 50 to 60 percent grant from uh, from Scale AI. You know, nice. so a lot of companies which are into supply chain companies like us, and who and who can think about AI and machine learning, but they don't have money or resources, have started mm -hmm. thinking about it. So that's where I feel uh, places like Sweden, France, Germany, um, Canada have an edge over other countries. But mm -hmm. uh, Rahul, uh, why don't you give your perspective about Singapore and Asia? <laughs> uh, I think Singapore has been great, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, think, I think we've seen a lot of grants nowadays, especially, uh, to really support SMEs as well, and, and, uh, and the MNCs as well to support robotics. I think that's been really great for, for us as well, to get, into the, uh, to get our products out there and to get people trialing the products. I think, I think at least, especially Enterprise Singapore has put a lot of grants out there to really support that adoption of products. Uh, so yeah, I mean, definitely been a good place and a good country for us to grow from. I think Singapore has been quite supportive as well. I think it's, it's been quite, quite impressive what the government has taken the initiative on. Well, well, without being too mercenary, Rahul and Niraj, uh, uh, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see if we couldn't uh, pull together some little project that integrates all our tech um, and, and in Singapore, Absolutely. that would be great. <laughs> there will be a win-win-win, you know, all around. <laughs> um, so, so Aisha has a couple of other questions which I thought was kind of interesting. I, I think, I think, uh, you know, these these uh, are quite easy to answer. Like, um, for Niraj, you know, how much would the implementation of automation at a supply chain increase the overall cost of goods, right? Uh, uh, um, and and you know, is 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 there kind of like a like a long-term scale in terms of how it eventually you know withers down? Yeah, it's a long-term scale. Like it's it's not about you cannot uh, kind of uh, start looking at per good cost. It's a capital investment which you'll have to start thinking in a very different kind of a budget system. Mm. But it, it definitely increases your cost of the yeah. goods to begin with. But the way we are looking at the uh, e-commerce fulfillment, uh, we are seeing 10x growth, and because of which uh, you know suddenly companies are started thinking about how. Uh, and what they need to do because our systems can literally operate 24 by 7, right? Yep. So they can yep. run multiple shifts and without having a lot of human intervention. So if you talk about the cost of goods, it typically is a very different kind of a matrix, but it overall company will have to start thinking about investment from a different budget, you know, so to say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at a longer run, you will start seeing a much reduced cost. And when you start thinking about uh, same day delivery, 
and the last mile delivery and everything. Overall, if you look at the entire supply chain, your cost of the goods is not only about actual cost, but entire supply chain cost, added cost. And using automation, you can literally reduce that cost. Yep. And that's yep. a big impact. For example, even reverse logistics, it's a, one of the biggest problems because what if out of 10 items which you have ordered, one item goes wrong, the reverse logistics is one of the biggest issue. And with mm. our, uh, our processes, it is not only about uh, the robotic processes within the skeleton, but when a person is scanning goods, when it comes to their um, workplace, it doesn't, I think almost 99% is foolproof. And if we can reduce that reverse logistics, that mm -hmm. also saves a lot of money. So there are different kind of matrix which you have to look into. Thank you. Uh, Mark has a question. Um, how would this concept of automation apply to companies who are still relying on traditional manpower, especially in these times when companies are trying not to kill livelihoods? Uh, what advice would any of the panelists give to companies who wish to embark on this strategy and yet retain their workforce? So I thought this was, this was really relevant to, 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 to today. Right. In which, you know, uh, uh, people have a fear of losing their jobs. You know, we always say that the, 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 ro the robotics helps to augment the work that the humans do, you know, but, but people are still afraid. Right. So, so how, what, what, what uh, is there any advice or any way of, of thinking about this, this problem that, 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 that um, any of you uh, would, would want to share with the audience? Well, yeah, I, I, I could just I could just say from 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 research that's going on right now. Uh, in Canada at an agricultural center, uh, you know, don't, don't worry about your job right away. Um, humans are really good at, 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 at things. Uh, you know, th there's research going on right now with, with, with Canova's arms to uh, pick tomatoes, cucumbers in greenhouses. Um, we will get to the point um, where, where we will be able to, you know, outperform humans on a 24 seven basis, um, with this and that, but we won't have all the expertise of the plant pickers. Um, uh, we'll be able to pick ripe tomatoes at a high success rate, right? Cucumbers at a high success rate, do, do pick all the boxes, but, but humans are still going to be required, uh, uh, all, all, all our testing shows that um, at least uh, <laughs> at least for the foreseeable future um, it, you know uh, let's get down to basic industrial tasks you know uh, the, the, the classic robotics ones Re repetitive hazardous heavy um, the, the repetitive tasks have been handled by industrial robots now for ages it, it, it's, it's moving it into unstructured environments um, where, where the tasks or the objects aren't exactly the same, and that's where it gets tricky. Human oversight will be required. Um, you know, even if we hit a 98% success rate um, at, at high speeds, human oversight will be required. So I, I, I honestly think the jobs will be different. The challenge and part of the responsibility comes to us is, is, is bringing the workers along, uh, having interfaces that are that are that aren't you know that don't require physics degrees to operate um mm -hmm. and, and, and and uh you know helping along to train the workers uh as it goes so there it is i mean we've seen examples throughout history of industrialization um it changes the nature of employment there are periods of great displacement that frankly are are, are unpleasant and that's where government policy has to step in but uh, the employment around the world continues to go up. I, 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 I refuse to be a complete naysayer um, or, or, or Luddite. I've, I've seen the bad and uh, our, our work with AI and, and automation uh, shows that, that humans still have, still, have a, still have a long run at the ball. Yeah. So at least we have our jobs, huh? <laughs> Um, Niraj, Rahul, I, 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 I saw you guys also unmute just now. Were there some, some of the perspectives you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can share. Uh, actually, uh, we just had a customer we're working with recently who's gone through the same journey. Uh, not logistics, more manufacturing. So they had uh, a manufacturing setup, a lot of traditional uh, workers involved. I think what they did was quite uh, encouraging for us as well because that's part of our B Labs initiative about retraining the workforce and they have value post-automation as well. So what they did was very simple. Uh, 
the adopt automation and send the workers for a four week training program. Very, very, I, I think quite impressive what they've done. Uh, so after the four weeks, instead of people carrying the heavy loads from different parts of the facility, feeding the machine. So now they just monitor the machines. They monitor the automation systems and only, only come into the picture when there's a downtime on one of the systems, they take care of troubleshooting it. So that was the focus of the, uh, I guess, the four week training program. So what they've done is before implementing automation, apart from just implementing the robotic technology, they also laid out a, a timeline of what they need to do for the workers during the implementation phase. So once the deployment is done of the robotic process, even the workers are pretty much already trained to use, use the systems. I, I think that was a very good, I guess, idea of how the entire picture looks like. Thanks, Rahul. Um, and I think we have question, time for one last question. And this is a question that we typically get uh, in general. Um, in regard to developing skills and education, right? So other than engineering degrees, which uh, in, in this in this panel, I think uh, two of you have, uh, and and uh, David and myself don't have. Uh, <laughs> you know, how can how can higher education prepare and train their students uh, for a future with robots, right? For job readiness. Um, I guess one of the important aspects for engineering is is, um, you know. Uh, definitely IoT and AI are one of the leading indicators in terms of, uh, you know, the companies getting into automation. And uh, that's where we call it as AIoT. Uh, it's a combination. So if people are talking about specific degrees in terms of computer science or electronics and uh, um, um, telecommunication, what I'm seeing is, is also a kind of a hybrid degree when they are not only taking computer science, but maybe specialization in AI or even domain centric when computer science and supply chain, actually. So I think uh, it is important. I, and as I always say that, uh, you know, there's a technical skill set and there's a domain skill set. Technical skill set, you can quickly evolve. You can be one of the best coder, but the domain and industry knowledge takes five to 10 years of a time. So you need to go through that process in order to understand the domain and the industry. But technology wise, if you're talking about supply chain, definitely we are talking about uh, mechatronics, we are talking about IoT, we are talking about AI and machine learning, um, uh, which are very interesting for us. And uh, that's where, uh, you know, in, in the city like Calgary, we have 210 odd people. And uh, uh, that's very, um, you know, exciting. And we are continuously hiring people who have these kind of expertise. Thank you, Niraj. David, Rahul, any last words on this? I would look at what machines aren't good at. Uh, machines are terrible at judgment, critical thought. Um, uh, if, if you want to demonstrate value as a human, let, let's look at what we are good at. We're, 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 we're exceptionally good social communicators. We exchange ideas quickly um, and, and, and we have a capacity for judgment and, and morals and ethics. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly you've got to be numerate, you've got to be literate, um, you've got to be able to communicate uh, with the engineers um, on a level of technological understanding. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there are still rooms for so many other skill sets, especially, let's get down into finance, et cetera, and the domain expertise. Right now we're, you know, starting to work with University of Alberta. They've got an amazing cross uh, uh, they bring medicine, dentistry, computer science, engineering, all into the, all into the same working groups. Uh, you know, we're so looking forward to getting their interns. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Rahul? Yeah, uh, I think just to add on to what Neeraj and David have said. Uh, yeah, I think the developing side is one thing, developing products. But I think there's, from the other side, from the user perspective, there's still a lot of lack of talent in terms of taking the robotic technology and applying it the right way. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So applying it one way, applying it away is one thing. Applying the right way is another important thing, I guess. So I think that's, that's one aspect of, of, of domain expertise and understanding technology, which has a lot of potential in terms of uh, getting ready for the market, I suppose. Thank you, Rahul. So, uh, well, it is 11 o'clock. 
I'm, I'm going to keep my word and, 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 and end this on time. Uh, so I want to thank all our panelists, um, Niraj, David, Rahul, for, for being with us today and, and for sharing your insights. I want to thank our partners, the High Commission of Canada, uh, for, 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 for doing this session with us together. You know, and, and thanks to everyone in the audience for, for staying on for the whole session. We have a, we've had minimal drop off towards the end, you know, but, but I think everyone stayed strong. <laughs> I hope you've learned something. Uh, feel free to connect with any of the, of the panelists uh, you know, uh, if you want to find out more. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Uh, Jin? Uh, thank you, Victor, and thank you to our panel of speakers for the great sharing, and thank you to everyone for your ongoing questions. It is always heartening to see so much enthusiasm in our online sessions. Um, and as Victor has mentioned, uh, real conversations happen after, so do hope that all of you keep connected. So the recording of this session will be uploaded on our SG Innovate YouTube channel um, in about a week's time, so do head on there for a review of today's event. And till our next online event, bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening and a good day to everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.